Uh, right, okay. Oh, so we'll, it's, our, it's our Pledge Sunday um, and our Harvest Sunday. It's great to see uh, so many people bringing some stuff for uh, the food bank. And, uh, you know, we, we, we always have this box knocking around somewhere in church. So although we want today to be a celebration of all our, our giving, you know, feel free to bring stuff for the food bank whenever However, we bless them, they bless us. As Mel said, it is a great partnership and uh, you know, we've been really blessed by them. And uh, we're hoping to be a continued blessing for them as well. Um, but not only that, like I said, it is our pledge Sunday. You may remember that um, before the summer holidays, I still got kids in school, so that's how I work my, uh, my yearly calendar. Uh, but I think it was back in June, we did a series on generosity. We looked at... Um, God's generous generosity towards us, generous service, and generous giving. And I said, there will come a time in September when we get to respond uh, to what God is saying to you. Actually, I don't know if you caught it in the verse that we had read to us, but, you know, we don't want to do sob stories. We don't want to put pressure on. Actually, we, the whole thing is about allowing God to speak to your hearts, to say to you, this is what I want you to do. This is how I want you to respond. But I told you there would be a day. And I told you we'd be the 26th of September as well. This shouldn't be a surprise. It's also been in the notices for a little while. And uh, we've definitely done the plugging for it. Uh, but a chance to respond, to say, this is the pledge I want to give. This is what, I, you know, this is, where I'll, this is what I'm going to be doing with my giving over the next year or so. Um, so in your packs... Before we get into the talk properly, I just want to tell you, in your packs, what you'll find, you'll find a how to give um, little form. You've probably seen one of these before because I wrote to you all during the pandemic um, and included one of those. But it's got um, all the uh, stuff in there, but different ways through church suites. Uh, you can text to give, um, standing orders, uh, and there's also a gift aid decoration. So if you're a taxpayer um, and um, you can... Uh, you can gift aid it, and uh, Rishi, if he's still, is he still the chancellor after the reshuffle? I think he is, isn't he? He didn't lose his job. He's got too many things on Boris. Um, so <laughs> Sorry, that's my politics showing again. Um, and uh, yeah, anyway, um, he'll give us 25p extra for every pound that you give. I mean, how amazing is that? Like, you know. Um, so there we are. Um, also, what you'll find is you'll find one of these little orange things, which have got a, a little uh, meet the people you're giving helps. I think it's always good. Uh, these, are, these are based on real people. Uh, names have been altered. Um, so uh, Clark, Diana, and Eric um, are not, well, they are real people, but they're not real names. Um, and um, I chose superhero names. I wonder if anybody can uh, knows who's Clark, alter ego for Clark. Superman, great stuff. Diana? Wonder Woman, excellent. See if anybody gets Eric. Good stuff. <laughs> Banana Man, look at that. I did this in the office, and then we went, uh, Magneto? It's like, no, he's a villain. So <laughs> it could have been Hulk, uh, Hulk, the Hulk as well, because that's Eric Banner as well, isn't it? but it's not, it's Banana Man. What? Is it David Banner? I thought it was Eric. Is it David? Oh. Okay, <laughs> but it's Banana Man anyway, so that's, it's a good job. Like you know, when Eric, because he's a kid, and when Eric eats a banana, he turns into Banana Man. Maybe just mine and Donna's age range, but there we are. I don't know. Um, a little thing here is uh, um, we're going to talk about this in the talk, but there's a, a, a Venn diagram and a uh, spectrum of giving, but we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. And then lastly. Um, we've got this with the piggy bank on it. Um, it's not at all British to talk about money, uh, but this is um, this is a response cards, and uh, I, I really want you to encourage you to fill one of these out uh, today if you can do. And uh, after after this talk, um, we've got a basket here, and I'm going to encourage you just to to, to do this. Ta da! It's magic. And, um, and, and as your pledge. Now, I want to just say, um, before anything, the only person who will see that is our treasurer, Mel. Um, she's the only one who actually knows who gives what, and you know, there's no way of avoiding that because she's the treasurer. Um, 
she kind of knows what goes in the bank and all that sort of stuff. You know, they keep, you know, that's, that's a good thing about treasures. They know what's going on. Um, but it's not discussed in the office. It's not, um, you know, discussed at PCC or anything like that. So it's it, because ultimately giving is between you and God. Um, so let me encourage you to do that and to know that actually you can do that in confidence and respond to what God has been saying to you over the last couple of months, really. We've given plenty of time for you to pray about this and to ask God about this. Anyway, let's dive into uh, enough preamble. That was only the preamble. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not joking. But let's dive into um, this, uh, this, this passage. Um, when I was in Kendall, when I was a curate, um, I remember going to the opticians once. Now, I used to have to go to the opticians every year because I've got an astigmatism that changes. And so every now and again, I'll start squinting at you. And it's not because I'm angry. Well, it might be. But it's, <laughs> it's not usually because I'm angry. It's usually because I think, oh, gosh, I need to get to the opticians again because my prescription has changed. And so I went to, I went to a well-known, um, well-known uh, branch of opticians, that is endorsed by the Tory government, um, and uh, will not advertise them. But anyway, uh, they uh, and they did this test, and I sort of knew what was going to happen. They would show me all these charts with you know you sit on that uncovered machine which you've got to rest your chin on and like be hunched over, and they'll go which one's clearer, A or B, and you always think I'm not too sure because it's such a minute difference. And so you kind of take a bit of a, oh, can I see A again? Can I see B again? Oh, maybe B. And then they go, okay, and you flip. And you always think, are they on for a laugh? Are they checking to see, <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, and to be honest, I was kind of expecting the same prescription as, as what I had because I had to go back, but I, didn't, you know, I knew I didn't need to go back. But then they did this thing, which they didn't do very often, which was take a photo inside my eye. Um, I think I must have been charged more for it. And, um, and, and then this, this, what this, this photo revealed was um, an anomaly with one of the vessels which was feeding into my eye. Um, and, the, and the optician went, ooh, that's not normal. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever a doctor or somebody who knows more about medicine than you uh, kind of goes, ooh, that's not normal, you kind of suddenly go like... <gasps> What do you mean? That's not normal, <laughs> you know. And uh, so he said. So he said, "This, this is. Don't be concerned." His next word was, "I was like, I'm like, doctors and people like that need to um, need to get better at the way that they deliver messages." I, I remember going going one time with uh, to the doctors with, with chest pain. It turned out to be indigestion, but it turned, <laughs> going with chest pain, and, and the doctor went, "I think you're having a heart attack. Stay calm." All I heard was, I think you're having a heart attack. <laughs> anyway, that one, not this time. Um, so, but they, um, so we went, so we said like, oh, that's, that's not normal. Um, we need to keep an eye on this. Uh, no pun intended. Um, and, um, and I realized that actually, they, what they said is that this, this could be an indicator of, um, an early indicator of some other more serious underlying conditions. And, uh, and thankfully it's not, but it, it really, it could be. It could be, and so they had to keep an eye on it. And do you know what? I went for other appointments. I went to follow this up, and I went, oh, okay, I need to find out what, what's going on here. And I actually went and got a second opinion from somewhere else, uh, from another opticians, and they weren't as half as concerned. Um, but really, this is a pretty good picture about what we're talking about today. So we're going to be talking about money um, again. Uh, we talked a bit about money, about generosity and stuff like that. But actually, it's really what we're talking about is money on the surface. It's, it's, money is always a surface issue. Um, and we're going to be talking about what the Bible teaches, about how we should give. And, and, and now, money is, is always a pretty big issue for all of us, isn't it? It's, you know, if we're honest. Um, you know, we could all probably do with a little bit more. Um, and and you, you may think that we're just just after your money, and we're not. But what, really what we're doing is we're trying to use it as a, as a lever to look at some deeper, bigger issues. Because actually that's what Jesus did, and it's what Paul does, and it's what the Bible does as a whole. See, when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, what we're looking at today is uh, he was concerned that the Corinthians do the right thing. Uh, he wanted them to complete the collection for the Judean church. Uh, the church in Jerusalem was, there was a huge famine going on at the time, and they were in absolute dire straits. Um, 
But his concern went a lot deeper, went so much deeper. He wanted them to see their hearts change at the deepest level. He, want, he didn't just want them to give. He wanted to, their hearts to change as they gave. And that's what the prayer is for all of us. And, you know, I'm in this as well. This isn't just me as, as a leader. I'm in this with you. I'm a disciple of Jesus as much as you. And I always need my heart to change when it comes down to, to finances. I am, after all, a Yorkshireman. You know, we have a reputation for a reason. Uh, so there's a guy called Tim Keller. Um, who's a, a brilliant theologian and a pastor over in the States, and, and he explains it this way. He says, um, he says, some people want lots of money to control their world and life. Such people usually don't spend much money and live very modestly. They keep it all safely saved and invested so they can feel completely secure in the world. Others want money for access to social circles, and to make themselves beautiful and attractive. These people do spend their money on themselves in lavish ways. Other people want money because it gives them so much power over others. In every case, money functions as an idol, and yet because of various deep idols, it results in very different patterns of behavior. And what when he talks about idols, he's talking about the things that we have our hearts set upon, the things that control and run our life. See, Paul doesn't want to change our behavior. He wants to set us free from the idols that keep money at the heart of our thinking and our way of life. He's using giving to do a deeper work. He doesn't just want our behavior to change. He wants our hearts to change. So in this passage, Paul gives us uh, two guidelines and two benefits. And we're, so we're going to do that. We're going to look at the two guidelines and the two benefits. And so the, the guidelines are relatively simple. And they're right there in the front. And uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pull up. We'll, can we have the Venn diagram, please? And you've got it in your little pack. Uh, but these are the two, um, the, the two uh, Guidelines. I forgot what I was calling it. It's there in big letters for me and I can't see it. Anyway, uh, but first one is give generous. Be generous. Paul is clear in the passage. We need to give generously. He says in verse 6, the point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully or generously will also reap bountifully. He uses a farming metaphor. You see, you can, you can sow in a tight-fisted way, that doesn't, but that doesn't really make sense. If you sow sparingly, you won't get much of a result. It doesn't make sense to try and save on seeds when each seed could produce anywhere from 30 to 100 times the number of seeds sown. My mom and dad gave me, well, they gave the kids, and I had to adopt them, um, two tomato plants this year you know basically like early in the season they, they said to, they said to the kids do you want some tomato plants and they were like oh yeah 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 we'll grow them we'll grow them and I was like no you won't it'll be me doing all the work and also I'm the only one that likes tomatoes and um and now you know it's it's harvest time or rather I've had to take them off to ripen them off, off you know because they've been growing outside so they're still green but they haven't so they're now having to ripen in paper bags um but do you know what? Those two tomato plants have given me an absolute glut of tomatoes. I've got so many of them overwhelmed now, which is great because actually one of my favourite lunches is cheese and tomato on toast. I love it, and I haven't most days. Um, but it's there. It's such a real living object lesson. We all know, don't we? That one seed produces so much more fruit. We've got an apple tree. Two apple trees, actually, in our garden, a, a, a fig tree that someone's planted. And we, you know, we're just constantly, because we've got a little puppy, picking up apples and throwing them away because, we, you know, he kind of thinks that they're a ball and they don't do good for his digestive system. Never mind figs. Um, so <laughs> so this, is, this is what Paul wants us to do. He wants us to sow bountifully. He doesn't want us to be, you know, and that's just one or two. And you see the harvest for them. We, you know, we, we couldn't get through all the apples. We couldn't get through all those. Well, we can get through all the tomatoes and stuff like that. But he wants us to be so generous with how we sow because actually the, the, the return on it is amazing. 
And so we're going to return to this theme of sowing and reaping in a minute. But Paul's message is clear. Don't do it sparingly. Do it in generosity. Be as generous as possible. I love how one church pictures it. And this is, this is coming up for the next thing, the other side of your, 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 your giving spectrum. Thank you. There we are. Excellent. Thanks, Dan. Um, and um, I, I came across this and I thought, oh, this is, this is great. Because we're all on this spectrum, really, aren't we? We all kind of give a little bit or step into the next bit. But you see, we are, it doesn't matter where we are on this spectrum. The, the object is to always be moving to the right. Is that the right way? It says, yeah, looking where my arrow's going. You know, to move from somebody who's, who's like an emerging giver to an engaging to an expanding to an extravagant. And even when we're in a, the extravagant giver, to, to keep on. But there's a second guideline that Paul gives, and that's to give cheerfully. Can we go back to the Venn diagram? Cheers. Um, see, each one of us must give as they decide to give in the heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's um, from verse 7 of, uh, of that reading that we've had. God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, <coughs> you would think that it's enough to give generously, wouldn't you? But it's not. It's not. Paul also wants us to give cheerfully as well. And Jesus deals with this. You know, he goes to the temple and he sees all these people giving generously, all these Pharisees, teachers of law and all that sort of thing, making a huge deal about how much they're giving and he sees this you know the widow with two mites giving in all that she has she's giving generously out of her heart but she he knows that she's he's, she's giving cheerfully knowing that god is her protector and her provider see everyone should give the amount they've decided in their own heart what you give is something you need to work out with the holy spirit and that's why we gave you plenty of space to do that it's not a public decision nor should it be flaunted however how much you decide to give how much you decide to give two things uh, should should not be true about your motives yeah I've, I've, I was lost in my notes and I was like oh, where am I yes yeah, so two things uh, sh- you know n- you know shouldn't be true about your motives first thing is it shouldn't be motivated by sad feelings the word reluctantly refers to sad or distressed giving in contrast to happy giving. Whatever you give should not be motivated by negative feelings. And secondly, it shouldn't be motivated by external pressure. So we've been there, haven't we? we know what it's like to have someone put pressure on us to give. And so and, and equally if you think, you know, that I'm trying to put pressure on you to give, I'm not. You know, actually, like this is between you and God. All I'm doing as 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 a leader is trying to teach you and say this is this is what we're hoping for and we're expecting because actually it's about a heart condition and we're, you know, we're following Jesus and, and this is the whole point of it. Um, see, God doesn't want you to give out of guilt or pressure or fear or anything like that. How, how should we give then is the question. What Deuteronomy tells us is that you shall give to him freely and your heart uh, shall not be grudging when you give to him because of, for this because for this the Lord your God will bless you in all your work and in all that you undertake. And again, Paul says, God loves a cheerful giver. Paul teaches us that there are two ways to, fall, to fail at giving. If you, if you give generously but not joyfully, you've given the wrong way. But equally, if, you give, if, you're, if you're joyful but not generous, then we need to Ask the question where our heart is at. See, God wants us to give in that intersection of generosity and joy. He wants your generosity. He wants your joy. He wants you to be cheerful and he wants you to be obedient. Randy Alcron, who's a a pastor in the States, another pastor in the States, um, says this. um, you You don't meet very many English Randys, do you? Let's face it. Uh, It's definitely an American name. He says, um, I have found that cheerful givers love God and love him more deeply each time they give. 
to me, one of the few experiences comparable to the joy of leading someone to Christ is the joy of making wise and generous choices with my money and possessions. Both are supreme acts of worship. Both are exhilarating. Both are what we are made for. So my question is, is have we discovered this for ourselves? If we haven't, then I think we're missing out on something. Giving at the intersection of generosity and cheerfulness is the one of the greatest privileges that we have as disciples of Jesus. And it comes with some amazing benefits. So let's just unpack a couple of those benefits. Um, We all know, don't we, that there there are things out there that try to entice you to give and go like, well, if you give this much, we'll give you a pen. (laughs) <laughs> you know, if you invest in this, we'll give you a, a, a CD player. Um, again, maybe showing my age. Um, see, for those of you who are too young to know what a CD player is, there's one over there. Uh, so <laughs> it's, um, but before iPod, CDs were the things. Um, but there are, I mean, there are t- two great benefits that God gives us and God meets us with when we give cheerfully and generously. Um, So first of all, God will give you what you need to continue to being generous. I don't know if you've ever thought about that, but I think that's amazing. See, when you give, you benefit. God is no debtor, says D.A. Carson, who's an amazing, amazing, amazing theologian. Like he says, God is no one's debtor. He bestows all kinds of heart gifts on people who give. God blesses generous givers. Verse 8 to 11 is all about that. The Bible repeatedly says that God richly blesses extravagant givers. In particular, God is able to make all grace abound to you. I don't know about you, but... I need more grace in my life for all sorts of different reasons, in all sorts of situations. And it's not a case we're not buying it, but he he gives, he gives, he gives, and he lavishes. He likes the idea of things being lavished upon them. I think it's one of those great words. God has the ability to lavish all kinds of grace on you. God is able to meet all of your needs. We are personally connected to the God who is able to lavish us with everything. Everything. You are personally connected to him. Well, why would God do this? Well, verses 10 and 11 of that reading told us, he says he supplies the seed, he he supplies seed to the sower and bread for uh, for food. Uh, And bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us all will produce produce thanksgiving to God. God will give you what you need so that you can continue to be generous. I've noticed this. I've noticed this in my life. God gives generous people more so that they can keep on being generous and that's not necessarily more money so that we can you know like oh i've given 50 quid and suddenly here's you know 200 i can give more but actually just he he does something in my heart and my mind and my thinking and 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 he's changed the way that our attitude where we've been able to go actually this this situation needs you know we'll 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 sacrifice And, and yet we've seen god meet those needs, our needs, because we've reached out to touch other people's lives. See, that kind of giving is exhilarating because it puts faith into action. We have this amazing way to live. It's a great cycle. Give more and then you then get more so that you can keep on giving more and experience even more joy. You know, it's 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 an amazing thing what God does. God will give you exactly what you need to be generous. But there's another benefit. God 
will use your gifts to bless others. When you give, others benefit. Paul mentions three specific ways that others will benefit. He says it will supply the needs of the saints. The poor will be fed, churches will be planted, missionaries will be supported, the gospel will be advanced. That's what we do. It's why we have mission partners. We're a, it's why we're a church who seeks to plant other churches, which, you know, always seems crazy when, you know, you kind of think, well, we're, we're just at the start of our journey, our adventure, our growth, what God is doing here. But we, we all have always done this from the start with the mind, but we're going to plant in other places and see other places come alive with the hope of the gospel. It will cause, the second thing is it will cause others to thank God and give him glory. When you give, you will be an answer to somebody else's prayer. It's amazing. You never know like, how, how your gift is going to transform somebody's life. When God uses you to meet their needs, they will thank and glorify God as a result of your gift. I've even seen it in non-Christians. You know, we, we've seen it and we've had people who are, who are quite anti-God for various reasons in their life and they've experienced generosity through us and suddenly have their lives transformed and they've become open and we've been able to have good conversations with them about the God who gives gifts. And thirdly, it will bring you closer to others. They will long for and pray for you because of your generosity to them. The benefits of giving are clear. Individuals, families, and churches can establish beachheads of strategic lifestyle, disciplined spending, and generosity, globally minded giving. You know, that's why we have free mission partners, one local, one national, one international, because we want to be globally minded in our giving. We do this as a church. You know, this is a culture that we've established it through PCC as well. So it's not just, not, we're not asking you to do something that we don't do ourselves. We can claim more, charity, more territory for Christ than we've ever dreamed possible. So this hope, this this vision of reaching and transforming Washington is possible because we give. It needs to be. That's why we've listed all the stuff that we do. And actually, the more we give, the more things we'll be able to bless our community with. See, a revival of lavish giving and strategic living is a revival of grace empowered by God. As a body of Christ gives and gets serious about giving and learning and living out of God's instructions concerning money and possession, Christ will be glorified. And he will send his spirit out into the world. And we'll see the transformation that we hope for. Not only that, but we will be changed. God will do a work in our hearts as we learn to give this way. So give generously and cheerfully because of what it will do for you and for the church and for the kingdom. It's interesting how Paul concludes this section. He says this, he says, Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. See, what is Paul referring to? Well, maybe he's referring to the glorious picture of Christians giving to help others. Maybe he's praising God for his work of turning us into generous givers. But underlying that gift is an even greater gift, the gift of a generous savior. A savior who gave his life for us. Paul doesn't end with our generosity. He ends with the generosity of Jesus. His generosity transforms us so that we can become generous people. See, we want, we want everybody to experience this. The generosity of God. 
and how it transforms us into generous people. Generosity is, is what changes the world. We want people to experience being cheerful in their giving so that you are blessed and so that you are blessing others. We want you to experience the exhilaration of cheerful generosity. If you have Jesus, if he's in your heart, you don't need anything else this morning, today, whenever you're listening to this, to start. You don't. There's a, there's a guy called Hudson Taylor um, who uh, ran a China Inland Mission years and years and years ago. He was an amazing missionary. And uh, when he opened up the first bank account for China Inland Mission, the bank asked him for his assets. And he wrote the following. I have the sum of £10 and all the promises of God. £10 wasn't much, even back then it wasn't that much money to go and do what he was planning to do. So you have everything you need to be generous, to be cheerful in your giving. So let's get started.